screen share and do like slides and the whole like exciting thing. So welcome to Understanding Trauma and Trauma Healing um, Tools for Peacemakers and Conflict Resolvers. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some basics, just sort of understanding trauma and how it works in the body. And then, because just talking about this topic at all can be difficult for trauma survivors, I'm gonna immediately teach some skills on helping uh, yourself or people you're working with come back from being triggered. And then I'm gonna go back into a little bit more theory, talk about why people just don't get over it, which is often what people are told to do. And then about a little bit about some of the things that we know now about post-traumatic resilience. And then I'll go back into some tools. Um, and then we'll have time for questions and I have a little evaluation and I'll ask you what you think. But at this point, I'm going to stop sharing and drop some things in the chat so you have some handy dandy handouts and hopefully that will work. So these is like a slides handout that is a PDF of all the slides I'm gonna show you so you can follow along and print it up and all those things. It's big, so it's gonna take a second to load. And then there's some exercises. Uh, from Rosma Menachem, who has written a fabulous book called My Grandmother's Hands on racialized trauma. And then some specific skill pieces from a wonderful book called, uh, or uh, I can't remember the name of it right now, but it's from a wonderful program called Capacitar, which does lots of work uh, all over the world. And then I uh, hand out with a bunch of different skills that I've put together that draws from different books and resources. So these touch on a bunch of different points and resources that are out there. It's not even pretending to be anything remotely comprehensive, but it's an introduction to a bunch of different things that can be useful in some different ways. All right, so I do not know Zoom well enough to know whether or not I should go back into the slot, into the like presentation while these this handout is still loading. So I'm gonna, tap dance a little bit here for a second and I'll introduce myself. My name is Dr. Rachel Goldberg. I am a professor of peace and conflict studies. I have a master's and a PhD in peace and conflict studies. I'm also a practitioner. I have my own consulting business and I'm a trauma survivor. So this interest in uh, trauma and trauma healing is something that's academic, it's personal, and it's professional. And I've done a number of these presentations now. And I am, you know, when I first started doing it, I was really nervous, like, is anybody going to want to talk about this? But my sense is, is that this is a really important topic, and that a lot of people want to, and, you know, that we as a society need to talk about this. All right, you should have all the handouts now. So I'll go back to screen sharing. All right. So I just told you a little bit about me, you told me a little about yourselves. So I'm gonna leap into the content. And one of the first things that I always say when I do trainings or workshops on trauma and trauma healing are these three things. Often one of the side effects of being a trauma survivor is that you feel like you're the only one in the whole world. And so I tell people, this is not uncommon. And if you are a trauma survivor or if you are working with trauma survivors, you are not alone. One of the other things that I often talk about is that a lot of the side effects or symptoms of being a trauma survivor can make somebody feel crazy. And that very often they are not. And that what they are manifesting are normal responses to abnormal situations. And the third thing that I always say is that no matter how long ago the trauma happened, you or the people that you're working with can recover. So basics, what is this thing? It's really useful to distinguish like something that's labeled as trauma or acts as trauma, you know, as differentiated from other kinds of things that are stressful or difficult. So Peter Levine talks about traumatic stress occurring when our ability to respond to threat is overwhelmed. And uh, Rosma Manikam, who I was just mentioning, talks about how that energy that isn't, um, 
incorporated because our system is overwhelmed is kind of stored in the body. And he talks about it not being metabolized. It's like a piece of food that you haven't digested. And Bessel van der Kolk talks a little bit more about kind of how we distinguish something that's a trauma by saying that we have lots of, you know, normal things in our homo sapien repertoire in terms of how we respond to threat. We're social animals, we tend to start looking for help. If we can't find help, we tend to go to fight or flight. If we can't do either of those, we tend to freeze or collapse and we can't register pain or respond to others. And that's usually the point at which something becomes trauma. And the way Bessel van der Kolk talks about it is that for humans, the best predictor of something becoming traumatic, traumatic is a situation where they're overwhelmed and they have no control. They can no longer imagine a way out and they feel overpowered and helpless. So it's important to know that trauma is not about the event. You can have two people in the same car crash, in the same car, sitting right next to each other. And one of them is traumatized and the other is not traumatized. A lot of factors can combine to you know, explain why you get traumatized or not. It can be your life history. It can be your, whether you're triggered into stuff that happened in the past, but the key dynamic is whether or not you're able to get some kind of safety and security or empowerment and reverse the event. It's also useful to kind of understand that uh, there are a lot of different types of trauma. Sometimes it's a single event, sometimes it's multiple events, and sometimes it's chronic events, ongoing or cumulative traumatic stress, for instance. It can also be secondary or vicarious. So it's really not at all uncommon for international development and aid workers, folks who are out there listening to trauma stories all day long and helping traumatized people all day long. After a while, if they do not do their trauma healing and self-care, they will start to manifest exactly the same symptoms as the people they're working with. And that's called secondary or vicarious trauma. And it can be just as serious as direct trauma. There's also something called participatory trauma, which is an interesting, uh, you know, area to sort of work in and understand, which is that people that are often labeled as perpetrators also go through forms of trauma and also uh, often what's called moral injury. So soldiers, police officers, uh, prison guards, uh, people who are asked by the profession or their context or limited choices to do things that they morally would not want to do. Uh, also can be traumatized. And then an important area is collective or societal trauma. So I'm sure PJSA folks in general are familiar with Johan Galtung, which said we've got to distinguish between direct violence, you know, somebody whacking you upside the head and the structures built into society that enact trauma like racism and economic disparity and the cultural factors and the cultural violence that support those structures to enact the trauma. From those, of course, trauma follows. And Dr. Joyce DeGroy has done really interesting work on post-traumatic slave syndrome. And there's also been really interesting work done on the ways in which uh, Jews, Holocaust survivors and families of Holocaust survivors, how these things pass through generations. And Van McVulcan and the Peace and Conflict Studies field has talked a lot about the transgenerational transmission of collective and generational trauma. So that's just some like basic, some definitional stuff. But another piece that I think is really important to sort of know uh, when you're thinking about trauma is again, this you're not alone part. And one of the pieces that I always think about is the ACEs study or adverse childhood experiences. And uh, in between 1995 and 1997, Kaiser Permanente giant health insurance company and the Center for Disease Control collaborated, did this gigantic study, over 17,000 participants and they looked to see if there are connections between what they called adverse childhood experiences. So they would have the survey, they would have things in it like, did you watch your mom get hit? Were you hit yourself? Did you watch somebody tell your mom that she was worthless? Were you told that you were worthless? Things like that. And um, th they correlated that with later 
health, social, and behavioral outcomes. So the first piece of news, which was, you know, changed people's thinking forever, was that there were very direct and very dramatic connections. People who had ACEs scores above a particular uh, level had very clear connections between later health issues. And I'm going to talk about that later when I when I sort of talk about how trauma acts in the body. But for the moment, one of the things that also really struck me about this study is that those 17,000 odd participants were by and large white upper middle class, educated, financially secure enough to have health insurance folks. So that's a pretty privileged bunch. Two thirds of those folks had significant childhood trauma such that it affected their health later in life. So if you think about like two thirds of that really privileged group, having significant childhood trauma such that it affected them later in life. And then you add to that like prisoners and veterans and people who are dealing with chronic poverty and structural violence, you know, people who come back from traumatic experiences or experience earthquakes or hurricanes, like there's a lot of us, right? There's a lot of trauma survivors out there. And in terms of what it does uh, is Peter Levine talked about this body, Rosma Men uh, this energy. Rosma Menachem talked about it being trapped in your body and not metabolized. There's sort of, this comes from the STAR, uh, Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience Program at Eastern Mennonite University. They talk about there's two big ways in which that energy can go, right? People can turn it in on themselves. And that uh, can lead to what they call a victim cycle. And also, sorry. Uh, very energy efficient, not so great for doing presentations. Um, that energy can show up in alcohol and drug abuse, overwork, depression, numbness, anxiety, self-blame. And then people can also act that energy out on others which can end up in repetitive conflicts, wars, inability to be flexible, being intolerant, uh, child abuse, domestic abuse, uh, difficulty in intimate relations, high-risk behaviors. And another kind of slide that comes from STAR that people really like, they love this slide. And I think there's a few different things that people like about this slide. For one thing, I think people can look at this whole list of some of the most common responses, there's lots more out there and recognize a lot and think, oh my God, I'm not crazy. You know, this stuff is a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. And then the other thing I like about this slide are these things at the bottom of these lists that are in caps. And for me, this gets at tros what, what, what they are now calling post-traumatic resilience that if you go through the work of healing your way through your trauma, you come out really powerful and strong and compassionate and wise. All right, this has been a bunch of, you know, introduction to trauma stuff. And again, sometimes people can be triggered just by this much stuff. So uh, first of all, I wanted to quickly ask if there are any questions just about what I've covered so far, and then I'll get into some trauma healing skills. Any questions so far? Okay, okay let's get started. I don't have any. That's okay. Um, so this first chunk of stuff comes from Golitz and all these things that I'm referring to are listed in the references at the end of the PowerPoint so you can go look them up. And in the um, skills handout. There's more stuff from Golitz and from some of the other folks. Golitz is a social worker. So this is drawing from social work. These are skills and tools that uh, she's developed as a social worker to work with clients. Obviously, if part of the way you get traumatized is because your system is overwhelmed and you have no control over your situation, two big things that you need in order to help folks who are trauma survivors is safety creating some sense of safety, and that can be limited given the context, but whatever safety you can get, and helping them maintain as much control and autonomy as possible. Other suggestions Golitz has just in general are showing respect and acceptance and relating in a conciliatory way that promotes trust and goodwill, not rocket science here, but things that people forget often when they're working with clients or students or people in conflict or stress. 
And another set of useful comment, uh, concepts, this doesn't come from Golitz, it comes from a great book on mindfulness for PTSD, is the usefulness of mindfulness. One of the things that can happen when people are trauma survivors is that they feel really dissociated from the world, they have difficulty staying present and, and they cut themselves off from parts of their human experience. So noticing, being present, being aware can really help control their reactions and get you back in your body and healing and also labeling and becoming aware of reactions. And this is a, a useful piece for sort of helping understand some of these reactions. This is Dr. Dan Siegel's hand model of the brain. He's a psychotherapist and this is how he explains the way the brain kind of works on trauma to kids. One of the most rewarding experiences for me has been to study brain science and apply it to the experience of parenting. And the hand model of the brain that I use to teach parents is very useful to understand that. So if you take your thumb and put it in the middle of your palm, put your fingers over the top, this is a very useful model of the brain. And when we can actually see in front of us what's going on in the brain, then we can change what the brain does. So let me walk you through very basically what happens in this brain and the structures in it. And it goes like this. The spinal cord comes up representing the wrist. And then you have coming up into the skull, the brain stem and the limbic area, which work together to help regulate arousal and your emotions and the way you have a fight, flight, freeze response. These are below the cortex, the limbic and brain stem areas. And the cortex is this higher part of the brain that allows us to perceive the outside world, to think and reason. And this frontmost part of the brain, right behind your forehead, so the person's oriented like this, is actually the part that regulates the subcortical limbic and brainstem areas. This regulation is very important because sometimes we can have all sorts of things happen in our life. We're tired, we're exhausted, someone pushes a particular emotional button and we can flip our lids. So rather than being tuned in and connected and balanced and flexible, we can lose all of that flexibility, even lose moral reasoning and act in ways that are terrifying to others, including our children. Now, you can actually bring yourself back online and come back to the high road and make a repair with your child. And that's important to explain to them. And you can also use this hand model of the brain to explain to children, even as young as five and six, how to understand when their emotions are rising up from the brainstem and limbic areas here and how it's overriding the prefrontal area and making it so they may be about to flip their lids. So I've had kids come tell me that, they're about to go flip their lids and they need a break. They need a timeout. And by even just naming that, they can tame it. And that's the power of using the hand model for ourselves and our children to help us all make sense of what goes on in the emotional communication that we have in the course of day-to-day -day life. All right. So some tools to help you unflip your lid or keep you from flipping your lid. So part of the lid flipping is that this part of your brain, the emotional brainstem, is reacting to a sense of threat and is flipping your nervous system into its sympathetic mode. So the autonomic nervous system has two modes, parasympathetic and sympathetic. And the sympathetic is the fight, flight, freeze. And what happens there is that glucose is taken from the forebrain. You're like using all of your brain power right here. You take energy away from the major organs and you throw it to the limbs because you're getting prepared to run away from the saber toothed tiger. Now that's great if you're in a crisis. But it's bad as a long-term plan because your parasympathetic nervous system is where you do rest and repair. When you're in your parasympathetic nervous system, that's when you're digesting your food well, you're healing your body, you're repairing your immune systems online. And this is part of why people that uh, are trauma survivors can have so many health effects because they spend a lot of time in their sympathetic nervous system. How can you get back? 
super easy thing you can do? Yawn. That is literally sending a physical message to your body that you don't have to be in the fight, flight, freeze. It is literally a way of physically telling your body you can come back. You can come back into the parasympathetic nervous system. Another thing that you can do is called 4-4 breathing. So you know when you're threatened, you have really shallow breathing, you know, right? Slowing your breathing down, just that, again, helps bring your parasympathetic nervous system online. So 4-4 breathing is literally you breathe in for a count of four, hold for a count of four, breathe out for a count of four, hold for a count of four. You are just deliberately and intentionally slowing down your breathing. So I'm just gonna try that with you guys for, guys for a couple of breaths. So breathe in, one, two, three, four, hold, one, two, three, four, exhale, one, two, three, four, Sorry, it's hard to talk and do this at the same time. <laughs> Hold, one, two, three, four. In, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Again, that all by itself can help relax, help you get back into a nice grounded place. As you may or may not know, dissociation, sort of checking out in various ways from parts of yourself or from the situation that you're in can often be a trauma survivor symptom. And so tools that help you get grounded and centered and back in the room and back in your body and back present can be really helpful. So a really simple one is just look around the room for everything that's blue or pick another color, you know, if you don't have anything that's blue in your context. And another one is called 54321. And so we can just quickly do that one. So look around you for five things you can see. And pay attention to four things that you can feel, like your feet on the ground, your body in the chair, breath in your lungs. And three things that you can hear. and two things that you can smell. And one thing that you can taste. So those are things you can use yourself or you can use with a client or tools that you can give a participant, say in a mediation before they come into the mediation. And then I'm gonna give you a slightly longer piece, which is a great piece that you or other people can use to build resilience on a daily basis before you're even in a difficult situation or um, just to build resilience in general. So this is from Rosma Menachem and it's about breathing, grounding and resourcing. I'm also gonna talk about finger holds but that's on the next slide. Okay, so take a few deep breaths. Let your body relax as much as it wants to. Think of a person, an animal, a place that makes you feel safe and secure. Think about it in as much detail as you can. If it's a place, do you hear the surf? Can you smell the salt? Can you feel the sand under your feet? Get that place or person or animal really clearly in your mind.
Now imagine that this person or animal is beside you right now or that you are in that safe place. Breathing naturally, let yourself experience that safety and security for about a minute. And I am literally going to set a little timer and give you a minute to be in that safety and security. Let it sink in that you're really safe and secure. <sighs> now feel into your body. Where does it seem constricted and comfortable or unwell in any way? So again, mindfulness being aware is helpful. Try and actually notice. Notice how your body is feeling right now. Pick one of these locations and focus on it. And just for a few seconds, let yourself fully experience the constriction or the discomfort. Now, once again, visualize the person, animal, or place that helps you feel safe and secure. <sighs> Imagine that safety that you're in that place, oh, or that the uh, person or animal is be beside you. Experience the safety and security for a minute. <sighs> so allowing your body to tell you whatever your body needs to tell you. Also hold your way deeply into that safety and security. And I will do it slightly less. I'll give you around 30 seconds this time. You might feel some shift. Some of that energy that's constricted might be released or opened. You might have some emotions that you're feeling. You might feel drowsy or tired. All right. And we can come back into the present and into this session. So that's a tool for building resilience, for building your capacity to hold that sense of safety and strength that enables you not to be kind of overreactive in the situation. Another thing that's super useful are finger holds. There are a number of different cultures that have these finger holds and use this technique. This particular uh, example comes from the STARS uh, Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience Program from Eastern Mennonite University. But uh, the, the handout I gave you is from a group working in Latin America using uh, this in a Latin American contract context. So lots of different cultures and contexts see the body as electrical as well as chemical. So for instance, Chinese um, therapeutic modalities look at the way meridians run through the body. And it turns out that these electrical meridians run through your fingers. And so just holding on to those fingers can help rebalance your electrical system in particular ways associated with those meridians. So the most of the people who think about this in different cultures think about the thumb as being associated with grief and tears. This is why little kids suck their thumbs. The index finger is about fear, terror, and panic, you know, how we're, we point our fingers at people. The middle finger is for anger and rage, you know what we do with the middle finger. 
The ring finger, you can think of kind of worrying a ring is being associated with worry and anxiety. And the small finger is for when you feel small or have lack of self-esteem. And literally just holding on to the finger for a minute or two can help balance and reset those meridians. Honestly, I can never remember which finger is which. So when I do finger holds, I just do them all. I just do one at a time and I'm sure there's some way in which they're all helping me out. If you're working with a small child that doesn't like have terrific dexterity, you can hold their whole hand or they can hold their whole hand. And that can help kind of balance kind of all the meridians at once. Another nice thing about finger holds, particularly in the era of Zoom, is that I can do this under the table and nobody has any idea that I'm doing it. All right. So any questions about those sets of skills, those are great skills for coming back when you're triggered, for helping you not flip your lid, for coming back when you have flipped your lid, and just for building kind of resiliency to reduce lid flipping. Oh wait, uh, do they hold a specific uh, finger? For what do they do this? So the idea is here. just to hold on to your fingers. So you can either hold one finger at a time or you can hold just all your fingers at once. There you go. Yeah. Okay, but uh, what if we have uh, that, that negative emotion to me that I just have everything, but do I need to put it on a fist? Um, I would like experiment with what works best for you. So there are energy meridians running through your hands and there are different ways of kind of bringing your energy and your consciousness and your focus to bear that can help rebalance. I tend to not remember which finger is which, so I tend to just do all of them, just like a minute at a time. So will it help me to stay relaxed? Well, one thing that I wanted to say about all of these tools is that all of these are awesome tools and none of them work for everybody all the time. Oh. So you have to figure out what tools work for you. Oh. What Or what tools work for the client that you're working with. So I'd say experiment with different things and see what works for you. And same thing for your clients or the people in the conflict that you're working with. So all of those, so all of those that helps to eliminate trauma, right? These are all things that help you deal with trauma and help you heal from trauma. Oh, deal and heal from trauma. Deal and heal. All right, I'm gonna go back into I some of the theory it. pieces. This framework, why people just don't get over it and the three pieces also come from the STAR program. I'm one of their trainers. Um, that often when people are traumatized, they're told, you know, pull yourself by up by your bootstraps, just get back on the horse, don't think about it, you know, don't dwell on it, just get over it. And that isn't actually possible because that unmetabolized energy is stored in your body, you don't just get over it, you have to heal your way through it. And three big reasons are because it affects your body and your brain, because it can affect meaning making and because it can leave unmet needs. So I just wanna talk about those three pieces. In terms of the body brain stuff, it's actually quite clear, you know, as the studies progress, that when you're traumatized or when you're triggered or when you're remembering a trauma event, literally parts of your brain shut down and other parts of your brain light up. For instance, when you're in that, uh, you know, fight, flight, freeze place, or you're remembering a traumatic event, you're right here in the limbic system. Lots of energy goes to the limbic system and the part of your brain associated, for instance, with speech shows lots less energy, which is part of why people can be really inarticulate and confused or incoherent when they're talking about their traumas. And then the other thing that can happen is a long-term kind of side effect of trauma that, that I was talking to you about, you know, that amygdala whole body response. Um, Bessel van der Kolk talks about it like a broken smoke detector. So the amygdala senses threat. And so as a trauma survivor, it's very easy for me to have my smoke detector go on and react. And then there's, it's also easy, hard for me to turn it off. 
So for folks who are trauma survivors who haven't kind of worked their way through a lot of stuff, they spend a lot more time in that neocortex and it's harder for them to come back. Um, and the other good thing to know there is that that can happen really fast. Menachem talks about the way bodies have these wordless stories about what is safe and what is dangerous. And that happens in the limbic part of the brain, the emotional brain. And this thing is fast. This thing is hundreds of times faster than your neocortex. So hundreds of times faster, that part of your brain is like, boom, react, danger, danger, right? And you flip your lid. And that can happen in as little as a fifth of a second or less. And then it's at least 20 minutes once your lid is flipped for you to come back, have that glucose back in the forebrain, be ready to do creative problem solving, think with nuanced compassion, right? All of these great things that we want in problem solving are neocortex things. And all that reactive defensive stuff is the brainstem stuff. For folks that are serious trauma survivors or who are very seriously triggered, they can be triggered for days. So it's really useful for us to know as peacemakers and conflict resolvers, if we're dealing with folks and we see them kind of going to that place, they are not going to be in their best brain. They're not gonna be in their problem solving, creative thinking brain. And they may need to get some safety. They may need to get some grounding in order to come back and be able to do that work. The way Star talks about it is when the body shifts into high gear, the brain shifts into low. Literally, you are less rational and less capable of thinking. Your peripheral vision is less. Your hearing is reduced. Your body is prepared to run away, not make complex decisions. One of the other things that Star talks about and I talk about are these unmet needs and meaning making. And so it's important to understand that part of what trauma can do to people is change their sense of self and their picture of the world. So we are weird creatures, right? We spend a lot of our life on the cusp of this reality that a lot of things are chaotic and fall apart. And the way we create sense out of our lives that we're constantly trying to create order and stability. So that's always intention. And obviously we can't live with the chaotic thing every moment, right? Because if we live with the chaotic thing every moment, I spend every minute living in, living in my house thinking, oh my God, it could catch on fire, right? And then I don't cook, I don't eat, I don't make the bed, right? Um, so you can't live there all the time, even though the reality is, yes, it's possible, houses catch on fire. So that means that when something traumatic happens, it breaks the normality we create for ourselves. And people can lose some core stuff like, oh, you know, I've already, I've jogged, I eat the right things, I'm not going to get ill. Or I live in a nice neighborhood, bad things aren't going to happen to me. Or my group or society is honorable and good. Or I believe that our leaders will protect us. All that stuff can be shaken by a traumatic event. And the way people come back from that is that they make narratives to put the world back to together, to make some cohesion out of the world again. And those narratives can either move you forward or keep you really stuck. The other thing that trauma does is leave people with unmet needs and they, they need to figure out how to start handling some ways to meet those needs in order to do the healing. Safety, particularly if the trauma is continuous, justice, vindication, somebody heard me, somebody got it an expression of identity, culture, or values, particularly if the traumatic event was about being victimized on the basis of those things, economic or other kinds of resources and support and respect and dignity. And I really love this quote from Rosma Menachem who talks about the intergenerational effects of trauma. And the stuff that we're talking about, he says, when this happens repeatedly over time, the trauma response can look like part of the person's personality. As years and decades pass, reflexive traumatic responses can lose context. These responses are typically viewed by others and often by the person as a personality defect. 
When this strategy gets internalized and pass, passed down over generations, it can start to look like culture within a particular group. One way to think about this is internalized oppression. Menachem talks about it as traumatic and persistent retention. He also looks at how this wordless story of safety plays itself out in bodies in racialized ways, particularly in the United States. And his book, which I recommend, My Grandmother's Hands, looks at the way, not your neocortex, your rational decision-making, but your wordless, you know, limbic emotional body can react in racialized narratives. So he talks about the white body seeing itself through that neocortex, uh, the limbic brain as fragile and vulnerable and looking to police bodies for safety and protection. It sees black bodies as dangerous and needing to be controlled, yet also as potential sources, sources of service and comfort. The black body sees the white body as privileged, controlling, and dangerous. It is conflicted about the police body, which it sees as sometimes a source of protection, sometimes a source of danger, and sometimes both at once. The police body sees black bodies as often dangerous and disruptive, as well as superhumanly powerful and impervious to pain. So that's just a, a really tiny summary of a whole part of a book. And I recommend that you look more to the book, but I think it gets at some important ways that trauma can play itself out in conflict. All right, how do you heal from all of this? The STAR model, looks at that, you know, victim cycle and the aggressor cycle, the acting in and acting out, and also about how people can find safety and support and break fee. And often that includes like societal acknowledgement, like memorializing or reflecting on root causes and acknowledging the other stories and can lead to reconnection, uh, including establishing new forms of like creative justice transformative solutions, which is the stuff we all work on, integrating trauma into a new self or group identity. All right, this is, we're, we're drawing to the end of the part where I do a lot of talking and we're getting into the more of the exercise part. So I know it's Friday night, you're tired. It's like the end of a long semester. Hang in there, we're getting to the more exercisey part. I just wanna talk a little about some of the things that we know that are really helpful for trauma recovery. This comes from Bessel van der Kolk, and I'm just letting, I'm not gonna get into detail about any of these things. I'm just letting you guys know that they're out there because it's really helpful. We don't talk about this enough. It's not publicized enough that there are terrific tools out there that are really helping people to do dramatic trauma healing. Again, none of this stuff works for everybody all the time. Some things work really well for some people, not that well for other people. So one thing is EMDR, which a number of therapists have now become trained in and are doing eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Uh, they use some of the tools um, that we've learned are associated with REM sleep with your eyes going back and forth so that you're doing something somatic while you are doing uh, some memory and reprocessing of the traumatic event. And that literally allows your body to somatically integrate the trauma and metabolize it in a normal way. Again, like one of the things that happens is that people become dissociated from their bodies. So embodied skills, yoga, tai chi have been, things like that have been found to be super helpful. One of the things we're gonna do a little exercise on comes from internal family systems therapy. I was really privileged to work with Dick Schwartz. I recently, I told some of you, I created this new model of conflict resolution. I'm calling multi-dimensional conflict resolution. I did a pilot project in East Harlem. I spent a couple of years working with partners there, designing a process that really worked for them. And, and Dick Schwartz as a, like a complete miracle volunteered to do a workshop for all of us. He's really interested in connecting internal family systems therapy, which is now like internationally famous with mediation. Fabulous. Um, internal family systems therapy has proven to be really helpful with a lot of folks who are dealing with trauma. And psychomotor therapy, which enables people to work with aspects of their trauma through physical structures, like stuff in a room or other people who are playing different roles, literally enables them to tell a different story somatically 
in a way that again helps them integrate that energy into their body um, in a healthy way. Neurofeedback, really interesting research being done, and there are therapists who are doing this stuff too that can help use neurofeedback to help get your brain waves in, you know, the alpha or you know other kind of better states. And then communal activities. So one of the things that happens when you're traumatized and like parts of your brain light up and other parts shut down is that you, you lose great abilities to coordinate with other people and then you feel isolated and like you're the only one. So you spend less time with other people. So doing something communally that has some kind of back and forth has been shown to be super helpful. In particular, theater is really helpful because people are literally physically embodying themselves in a different way. So just quickie overview, just so you know, there's lots of good stuff out there. All right. So I'm going to go over the handout and what's in there. But before we get to that, do you have questions about any of the kind of content-y stuff that I've just gone over? Um, no. No is a perfectly fine answer. All right, so let me go over the handout just so you know what's in there. So this is the you know one that has on the front cover 101 trauma-informed interventions. There are not 101 trauma-informed interventions in this packet. That's just a page from the book so you know what book it came from. Um, again, I always just wanna say this a couple times during a presentation. If you are a trauma survivor or you're working with somebody who is, this is not uncommon, you're not alone. Much of what you're experiencing are normal responses to abnormal situations. And no matter how long ago it happened, you can recover. So there's three chunks of skills that I have here in, and in the other handouts. One focuses on self-awareness. Obviously self-awareness is something we all need as conflict interveners. And it's also super helpful for trauma survivors. So a couple of the different things that I have in here are Dialogue with your inner child, understanding implicit childhood messages, and developing a nurturing voice. So the developing a nurturing voice one gets at the fact that like we all got this inner critic on all the time, you know, whatever you're doing, there's a part of you saying you're doing that really badly, or you could do that better, right? And so the exercise is on thinking about somebody you know that's a wonderful nurturing person, fictional, real, you know, from television, whatever and trying to talk to yourself with that voice, which I think is a great exercise. And I also think, you know, I'm intrigued by thinking about what would it be like to mediate from that voice, to intervene from the place of that voice. The next set of skills that are in here are ones on dealing with triggering or emotional hijacking. Um, self-awareness and care, and we went through those. And then the last set are on helping develop post-traumatic growth. So in the book there, I mean, in the packet, there's some nice stuff on kind of understanding the autonomic nervous system, um, some more tips from Golitz, stuff about, you know, what goes on with the whole yawning and why the yawning works. And then also just a little bit on emotional freedom technique. Have any of you guys ever heard of EFT? I don't even know that. Okay, it's great stuff. Um, so there was this guy, weirdly enough, an engineer who was trying to figure out how people could recover from emotional problems that are stuck in your body. And there was really interesting work being done on using acupressure points and tapping on them to help release energy that was stuck in the body and have it be, you know, emotionally integrated into your system in a healthy way. But it was this like ridiculously complicated, crazy system. So this engineer was like, all right, screw that. Let's find a really simple thing that's a really simple recipe that people can do. So what I gave you is the EFT or emotional freedom technique basic recipe. It talks a little about it. It has a diagram. I'm not going to run you through it. Um, for a couple of reasons. One is because there's like now a million YouTube videos on this that are great, but also because we don't have time to kind of give it justice, but I'm letting you know that's out there. 
anybody can use this. There are a million instructions on it. You can learn how to do it in 10 minutes. And it's proven to be very helpful for a number of people. Again, like everything else, there's a percentage of people for whom it's fabulous, and then people for whom it's not so helpful. Um, one of the other things that Golitz talks about is micro advocacy, which I think is really cool. So like, obviously, if part of getting traumatized is you have no control and say over the world, if you give people some advocacy tools, helps them heal. Well, sometimes it's a giant thing, right? And that person can't get their hands on the whole thing. But maybe there's like a little micro way that they can self-advocate or a little micro way in which they can start to have some traction on the thing. That can be really empowering. And another thing that's really common for trauma survivors is all or nothing thinking. So when I go to the lit flippy place, it's very easy for me to think, you know, everything's terrible, nobody likes me, nothing's ever gonna be good again, right? Like it's easy for me to go to that like completely all or nothing place. And um, the three blessings exercise, which we are actually gonna do in a little bit, can be super helpful for that, for helping break that pattern. So that's just a quickie overview of the tools. And then I'm gonna run you through an exercise on internal family systems therapy. So any questions about just like what's in the packet, what tools you have, anything so far? All right, uh, let's Those should be helpful to us, yeah. That's my plan. Yeah. That's where we're going. We're trying to do helpful. All okay. right. So let's do this internal family systems therapy. So internal family systems therapy, the basic idea is that we are not like this one unitary being, that we're kind of a little collective that all of us has these different parts that take on different roles. And that often our most kind of creative or vulnerable or sensitive parts, when we're traumatized, take on particular roles either to protect us or to keep us safe from particular emotions that we don't wanna feel. And that those parts can get stuck in particular moments in our development or places in our life and kind of continue to do that role forever till we, do the work of healing it. So one of the ways that Dick Schwartz says you can figure out like IFS might be good for somebody is if they really cognitively in their neocortex want to change something like I wanna stop drinking, right? And they can't. Some other part of them takes control and they lose the intention that their neocortex has and that doesn't happen. So the question is, is that a part you can talk to and work with and heal? And his thinking is yes. So this is, you know, I don't want to open anything very big up therapeutically. So this is a small kind of part that we're going to start working with. And this exercise has two parts, one where you're kind of reflecting on your own and the other where you're reflecting on the process in pairs. So grab a piece of paper and a pen, something so you can take some notes. Or, or your computer is fine too. Does everybody have a, a way to take some notes? All right. I have a finger in my pen. Excellent. Pencil, pencil, pencil. Awesome. Okay. So okay. for part one, using your paper and pencil or pen, just take some notes. These are just for yourself. You don't have to share them with anyone else. And we're just gonna look a little bit at this idea of working with and healing parts. So think of a time when you flipped your lid and kind of went to that place where you were reactive or defensive, just sort of not in your most creative, compassionate, you know, best self. And think of a time when that happened in the last few months. So just take a minute and like bring a moment to mind. So this shouldn't be, you know, like a moment where you were about to kill someone with an ax, you know? So don't go to the most traumatic, awful like thing you ever did, but a moment where you, you weren't your best self and you kind of were caught in this reactivity or this part of yourself that isn't the part of yourself that you love the most. So just take a minute and think of a moment when you flipped your lid in the past few weeks or months. Everybody got one? Anybody need another minute?
Are you are we are we good to move on to the next part or do people need another minute? I see one thumbs up, two thumbs up. Oh wow, well, I was trying to think about uh, hang on, I, I feel like I have one but it, it, it may not be exactly right. It doesn't have to be exactly right. There are uh, no, there are no I, might, I might have to share one. No, no, don't don't have to tell us about it. This is just for you to remember for yourself. All right, I think most of the folks have one. Now, imagine that that part of you that flipped its lid wasn't all of you, but was just a part. And try and think of it like as a little being and think about what that little being would be like. Is it a little imp or a child or an animal or an object? And don't second guess or drive yourself crazy about this. Just let whatever kind of symbol or metaphor pops into your mind, pop into your mind. And you don't have to like tell anybody, but just for yourself, take a little note about, you know, the way you're seeing that part. So is this the good fairy? Is this the, you know, little dog nipping at your ankles? Is this a lightning bolt? Whatever it is. And then just spend a minute. And again, I'm gonna use the timer and give you a full minute to just hold curiosity for that part. So often what we do with these parts of ourselves is we try and control them or stuff them down or push them aside. And we can often relate to our parts in ways that are similar to the way authority figures related to us in our life. So I'm gonna ask you to switch all that off just for a minute, literally just a minute and just hold curiosity and kind of think about whatever that part is. Wow, why do you do that? So that's it. I'm gonna put on my timer starting now. I feel like I don't even understand this part. Imagine that part also. <laughs> Imagine a, a, a part of yourself that does something that irritates you or bothers you Oh. And instead of judging it, uh, just hold some curiosity for it. All right. Now, ask that part of you how old it thinks you are. So usually I ask people to drop this in the chat. So I think I will stop sharing just for a second and ask people to drop that in the chat. How old does your part think you are? And I will answer that as well as ask it. I feel like I don't have any trauma experience. That's great. But uh, oh, that happens when we are, we can almost die from it or something. I don't know. No, not necessarily. As I said earlier, there's all different kinds of trauma. So that little part of you that you were just talking to you, if you were just to ask it a question, how old do you think it would say that you were? How old does that part think you are? 13, eight, seven, three, 10, 17, just a little child, eight. So, I saw Dick Schwartz do this presentation to a room full of therapists in New York City, like 40 therapists. And you could see them like flipping out. They were like, five, there's a part of me that thinks I'm five, right? You know, they didn't say that, but you could see that they were like, oh my God. And I think that's like one of the big ahas of doing this work is that you realize there are parts of you that don't know the thing that your conscious neocortex knows. So when I first started doing this work, I had a fabulous but difficult mother. And um, 
there were parts of myself still playing out some scripts to try and please my mother. And I, and I had a little like chat with those parts. And I said, you know, she's been dead for 15 years. And they were like flabbergasted. They had no idea. There was literally a part of me that did not know my mother had died 15 years ago. So if you think about that, that we have this collective in us and that some parts of us are stuck at different parts of our development and literally don't know things, haven't absorbed the growth that other parts of us have absorbed. It makes sense that we do these behaviors that aren't necessarily what you know our neocortex would want us to do. So the great news is that you can heal those parts. You can go into conversation with them and heal them. I'm going to stop at this point because I don't wanna open up any big emotional doors for anybody without you having you know this help and support to kind of work through why you exiled those parts or why you don't have a regular chat with those parts. But I do wanna get you into pairs so you can talk to each other just a little bit about that process. So you don't have to talk about specifically, you know, what you felt or when you flipped your lid or what you thought about, you know, that being unless you want to, but just talk about what it did feel like to try that process. So I'm just gonna get you into pairs and you can just take uh, like a minute and just like process with each other kind of what was that like? Oh, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't put people in breakout rooms. Okay. We can get uh, that I enabled can, for you. I can uh, actually Susan, yeah, I can uh, actually. Professor Cushman, uh, will you uh, join with me? Um, uh, uh, Professor Gold Goldberg, I can make you a full host and you should be able to do that. Oh, look, there's breakout rooms. It's so exciting. Okay. Okay, just put me with uh, Professor Cushman. I'm, I'm just, I don't know if I can actually have time to do that. So I'm just gonna um, do it randomly. And so there'll be two or three participants in a room. You don't have to talk about anything personal. Just talk a little bit about what the process was like. But, but what about? kind of what it felt to do that exercise. How, what did you think about just trying to talk to a part of yourself? Do you think this is useful? Do you think it's not useful? And you don't have to share it if you don't want to, Spencer. You can- As a matter of fact, you don't have to say anything you don't want to say. Hey there. Wait, I am. I'm obviously confused about something. I was trying to write the journal about everything what I have so far. So you presented some various tools that help to recover from trauma. Mm -hmm. And and I can tell that it. Hang on, I'm just writing it. So in a few seconds, everybody will be back. So you, this might be a just conversation I have with your professor because I think everybody's going to be back right about now. There we go. All oh. right. So what struck folks? Did you have any, you know, interesting ahas or sense about like what you what you thought about that process? How did that and, go for you, Spencer? How did that go for you? Well, um, pretty much I don't even experience trauma like I don't feel 100% fear but I just try to stay myself relaxed and that should be fine with me good that sounds great for okay. extent hang on let me take one example um actually I'm 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 nobody has to use any examples nobody has to talk about anything particular I'm just asking folks in general kind of what did they think about the process so I, I'm going to check in with some other folks for a minute other folks how did you feel about the process 
And welcome Jennifer, by the way. Well, I, I can I can start. Jennifer and I were partners, and I shared with her that the whole flipping of the lid metaphor was interesting because I went back to a time where I was a little bit defensive, um, talking with a colleague about something, and uh, I don't know was it supposed to be defensive or was it supposed to be like traumatized? Because I, I wouldn't describe it as traumatized how I felt. That's totally fine. This is a tool that could be really helpful for trauma survivors, but I was helping you access it at a really low level. So I wasn't asking you to like re-experience the trauma. I was just asking you to try and get it in touch with a part of you that's maybe a part that's not your favorite part of yourself. Oh, right. I, I know I didn't re-experience anything. I just think that I maybe like Spencer, I don't know. I in when I think of flipping one's lid, I think of getting a little bit upset, not traumatized. So I might have gone to a different experience that wasn't trauma, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, you probably did, because I really tried very hard to ask you guys to go to a different experience that wasn't trauma, because I do not want to reopen traumatic wounds here in a workshop. Right. But I don't, we don't have the therapeutic capacity here to help folks to process that. So that's why I was giving you, you know, irritation instead of trauma. Oh, I see. Good. Then I did have that. <laughs> you were great. You were all over it. <laughs> all right. Any other kind of reactions or thoughts about internal family systems therapy? Well, so I, uh, I shared kind of that this four years of gaslighting has been like, um, I think, more of the irritant <laughs> um than the, the than the trauma but um but in that context that i have identified you know that i, I manufacture conflicts that are smaller so i can focus on the small conflict and actually avoid or ignore the bigger ones so that like i mean i know you said you didn't want the examples but it's like i'll focus on how much i hate being lied to as opposed to the fact that we have a president that's threatening the whole planet, you know? And and like a lot of uh, trauma healing or trauma reaction strategies, that's a fabulous short-term plan in a really bad long-term plan. So like all of these things that get us like to dissociate or to shut down or to refocus are great when you're in crisis or when you have to pull yourself back together. But as a long-term life plan, you know, we're going to let the president blow up the planet, which would be bad. Yeah. And so I reflected that that was like my 17 year old strategy. And, um, and, and it's funny because I never really thought that I was being strategic and trying to be like deceptive and, you know, of avoiding the real problems and, and masking it with those smaller conflicts. But yeah, I could, I could totally, I could totally see where that worked. I just, I couldn't do it in the short time frame. When they said one minute left, I was like, I felt pretty shitty because I hadn't even let the other person talk yet. I know. I and 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 we only have 15 minutes left. So I was actually going to ask you what you wanted to do with the 15 minutes. Um, but before that, I want to make one point about internal family systems therapy is that it's it's all kind of growth and health oriented. So his conception is that all those parts are trying to keep us safe. So even that 17 year old part of yourself that's obsessing about people lying to them is doing it from a good motivation. So if you can understand that that part of you isn't like out to get you, but actually is trying to like keep you safe, just like working with parties in a conflict, you can eventually get that part to help keep you safe in a healthier way. So that's like, you know, thousands of hours worth of learning about internal family systems therapy in like 30 seconds. So I've missed most of the content, but I did want you to sort of get that point that that part of you probably is doing what it's doing with good intentions. Yes, Spencer. Oh, wait, um, okay, I just got an idea. But uh, during the war, especially, uh, we are afraid of dying. Does trauma come from that situation? Well, what Bessel van der Kolk says is that it's no one particular kind of event. So oh. there can be people who are in a war who are afraid of dying, who become traumatized by that particular battle. 
oh, and people sure, who are in that particular battle who have some sense of agency or control over what's going on who don't get traumatized. So it doesn't depend on any one given kind of event. The big factor there is whether or not in that threatening event, people feel like they have any control or, or in agency. Or so that means they must bring up fear. Fear is very heavily associated with threat, I think. Oh, yes. Yeah, so they bring up something. Um... That's very interesting, Spencer, because my uh, my the, the image that came to my mind when I was asked to think of an image was the is, was a Siberian saber tooth tiger. <laughs> And, and it's pretty scary stuff. So uh, that was really interesting. I just wanted to say, uh, Dr. Goldberg, it was really interesting exercise. It was quick. It was for me, at least it was quick. It was accessible as well. I never really thought that it could be so simple to gain an entry point into those parts of, you know, our psyche that we don't touch or talk about. I always think it should be so complicated, but it, it was so simple um, to take a look at it and say, oh, there's my saber tooth tiger. Wait a second, I'm not supposed to be scared of it. He just doesn't understand that there's a lot of things about me he has not learned about yet and to have that conversation. So that was, that was pretty cool. Thank you very much. Sure. I love this stuff. I'm a gigantic fan. I love internal family systems therapy. I've done a bunch myself. Um, and I also totally acknowledge that there are some people who like eat it up with the spoon and other people that are like, yeah, this doesn't work for me at all. <laughs> you you all said right. you wanted to ask how we wanted to handle the rest of the time. Did you I was going to say, move? yeah. I have Did one you... more exercise I can okay. do with you or we can just do Q&A and it's up to you guys. What would you like to do with the last 10 minutes? We might have to do Q&A. You'd like to do Q&A? Okay. I'm totally I, fine. I'm willing to say you can do your activity and we don't have to end at that specific time unless you need to end at that specific time. I'm okay with going over, but I try and be really respectful of people's time, especially Friday night <laughs> when it's tired and the end of a long day and a long week. So, you know, I will let the group decide. Um, what would the group like to do? Would you like to go a little bit over and do the exercise and have Q&A or would you like to pick one or the other? I am completely oh, fine with either of those options. We have a vote for exercise. So feel free to drop in the chat if you have like a particular uh, preference. Oh, oh wait. Um... Um, Actually, I drinking alcohol, with does drinking alcohol cause a trauma? Again, it depends on kind of what happens when you're drunk. Um, oh, okay. Ha hang on a sec. There was somebody else speaking. I just want to make sure I heard from them. Was that Shreya? Yeah, I was just going to say something about the previous exercise that we did. Um, I think that dissociation itself carries a lot of stigma with it um, in in I think all societies but in specific in the Indian context it carries a lot of um, lot of stigma associated with it and I just want to point out like my aha moment for that was just the fact that dissociation is not only associated with like the DSM classified dissociative disorders it's also associated with us in general like in our lives and in our responses because obviously everybody is not behaving the same way that they behaved um in like when they were a child or when they were four or five years old. And that part of us is in a way dissociated from the part that we are right now. No, I remember when I had that aha, um, when I was early on in studying this stuff and I realized that like regular day-to-day -day behaviors of like, you know, I'm not gonna answer the phone. You know, I'm not gonna check the news for a few hours. Those are also ways of checking out. And some of those are really healthy. So like I'm actually at this moment in history, a big fan of taking short news fasts. I think that keeps you sane and healthy. Um, but also I'm aware of the fact that that's me deliberately checking out in some ways. And so I think, you know, obviously clinically the term has narrow definitions, but operationally, I think we use it lots of different ways and it shows up in lots of different ways. Um, so we have not made a decision as a group. 
So we have a vote for doing an exercise and we have a vote for um, doing Q&A. Does anybody want to do both and stay late? If you do, please put both in the chat. We have one vote for both. A very, you know, easygoing person. Somebody else that's okay with that. All right. There's there's a there's a larger contingent okay with staying late than I would have anticipated. All right. So um I'm going to start with Q&A in case there are some folks that are, you know, losing it or somewhere else they have to be so that if we run out of time, they can like check out. And then for everybody else who wants to stay, I'll do the exercise after the Q&A. How's that sound? Got a plan? All right. So Q&A, you got some Q's? I might have some A's. I, ha I have a question. Hey, uh, do we, uh, hang on. So when I see a lot of people that have trauma, we, do we just have to uh, take care? We was, I just missed something. Why don't you get a little clear about what your question is and I'll talk to Wim and come back. Does that sound good? All right, Wim, what's your question? So this is a conversation that occurs in different ways. I'm pretty sure I had this conversation with Dr. Cushman um, before. Um, but the part where when we teach, we know we can't guarantee comfort, but we do want to guarantee a safe space. But that because of what we're teaching and we're covering things like genocide and like really brutal historical events or current events, um, I can see that there would be great applicability for preloading some of that with like some of these exercises to say, so we know that this is going to be um, triggering in different ways and offering, you know, that there are ways you can manage that, that we want to make sure we cover the material. Because if we avoid it, we're undermining the education. But at the same time, the diversity of the classroom means that some people really might have um, more exposure. But in, in that case, somebody who has no, I have no license to perform therapy in a classroom. Um, would you one recommend um, to try to do or use some of these tools or not to do it when you're not qualified to do so? And if so, do you have any like favorites for the classroom? Um, I actually, the the more I learn about this, the more I study about this, and the more I do this, the more I realize like everybody everywhere really needs some trauma healing tools. <laughs> um, so I actually, I'm teaching two classes right now. One is like an applied class where everybody's trained as a mediator and another one is a basic intro class. In both classes, when we do the sort of morning housekeeping stuff, uh, you know, I did it every week for the first few weeks to class, I would drop in a trauma healing skill. And honestly, it's not hard to make a rationale. We're in a pandemic. It's a stressful time. Trauma healing skills are useful. Let's all have some, right? So, I mean, that just like was not a tough sell. And my experience is, is that the kids love it. It's like five minutes. It's a little skill that five, four, three, two, one, yawning, four, four, breathing, just drop it in. And I do it early in the semester. So they've got that in their repertoire. And um, I also I have a unit on trauma and trauma healing where they read some Ros Momenicum. Um, so they get a little bit more in depth in this particular class. Because again, the more I learn about this stuff, the more it seems absolutely directly connected to conflict and violence out there. Um, so I think we've got a super rationale for this being part of our class, like, cause it is. Um, and I think those skills are fine. I do not claim to be a therapist or make space for people to process emotional problems. Being a professor who teaches peace and conflict studies, like people tell me stuff and I try and support them and get them to the counseling center. So I think, you know, we all spend lots of time talking to people in conflict if we teach this. But um, I don't make space for people to process that in class. 
um, because then they get into that therapeutic space. Then they start like confessing giant things and triggering each other and it's a mess. I actually tried doing circle processes in every class last year, which was great, but then there was too much of that therapeutic space and we had to like really set some boundaries on what people talked about. Um, so uh, absolutely, I guess is the short answer. And I don't think, again, I don't think it's hard to justify. So I don't think you have to say, we're going to be studying genocide. You might be triggered. It's going to be a heavy topic. I'm going to give you, you know what I mean? You can just be like, hey, this is good for everybody. It's associated with our class. Let's have a few. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> Spencer, did you get clear about your question? Uh, no, it's okay. I'm just just typing my journal about everything what I have obtained so far. Okay, does somebody else have a question? Um, yeah, I have a question about like the finger holds and some of the tools that you that you brought up. Um, I'm kind of wondering about when, I mean, I think from my own experience and from what I understand, it's it's very important to be able to feel fully the emotions and process them when they come up. So, um, so what, with, given that context, like what, what do the tools and the finger holds try to achieve? Like, um, I'm sure they're not there to like deaden emotions. Um, so yeah, what, what are they for? I got it. I mean, I think I got it. So this isn't about emotional suppression. So you're not trying to suppress or cover up emotions, um, but you are trying to self-manage. So, so that's why I have three different sets of skills in the handouts. One is the self-awareness where you're spending time with your mindfulness, with getting clear about being aware of what you're feeling. Some of the skills I, get you, I gave you were about like spending a few moments feeling how your body feels right then. And other ones are tools for I'm in a meeting. You know, I can't flip out in the middle of the meeting. I got to get my job done. I got to go through my day so that you can help. In my case, my broken smoke detector not go off all the time when I'm really not unsafe. So um, does that get at your question? Cool. Hi, um, I just had a question. You repeatedly spoke about how not all of these techniques work for everyone, but it has also been my experience that a lot of the times you find that you, the person that you're working with is unwilling or unable to process information and they do need to sit with those techniques a little longer just to see if they do work in fact for them or not. And I was just wondering how you make that distinction as to when somebody needs to be encouraged to sit with a technique and when you should just let that go and move on to the next thing. So I'm not a therapist. So like, I don't advise people to go do IFS or EMDR or neurofeedback. Um, so I think from a therapeutic standpoint, what you're saying is absolutely correct. I actually just know, I do trainings like this. I work with clients. Um, and I know some of the research now because I've been working on this for a while. So for instance, um, I think EMDR has been like fabulously useful with one third of returning veterans and like one third of returning veterans is completely useless, has no effect, like, you know, in clinical trials has like no effect, whatever. And then like, there's a third for whom it's somewhat useful, you know, so that's just what I mean by that. Not... Um, whether or not you, you kind of have to stick with something for a while to see if it works. I, I absolutely agree with you. And I think you're correct that that's often the case. Um, and we can talk a little bit as a group, if you want, about like how you would use these tools with clients, if you were a mediator, or if you were a peace builder, or if you were, you know, a conflict coach. Sure. Yeah, you're totally right. <laughs> um. Hang on, I feel like I'm done with my journal, but I, uh, it looks like, hang on, um, the, hang on, 
And I'm just thinking about some of the. the did you tools, have a question? Right? Did you have a question about the hand model of the brain, Spencer? The hand model of the brain that we learned about? Oh yeah, that's like this, right? Right. That's right. The, the front part of the brain. Right. Oh yeah, uh, hang on, let me just got that down. Okay, so I'm just adding in more detail and that should be fine. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on to the exercise. Um, and then if anybody has final questions after that, we can, but I promised you, right, you know, <laughs> I would move on at this point. In a dish. So if you look at the handout, the very last page of the handout that I gave you that is the skills packet is this three blessings. Um, so this is another one where you just grab a pen and paper or you can take some notes in your computer. And the exercise tells you every night for a week, just before you go to bed, think about anything good that's happened to you during that day and write down three of those things, kind of breaking it down in this particular way. Obviously, I'm not telling you to do this every night for a week, although it's a great exercise, but we're just going to think about it, you know, right now as one example. And this is one of those exercises that can help trauma survivors get out of that all or nothing thinking. Or for those of you who are familiar with narrative mediation, Gerald Monk talks about conflict saturated narratives. So it's really easy for trauma survivors to go into conflict saturated narratives. That guy's out to get me. He hates everything I do. He has no respect for me. This workplace sucks, right? And you can just layer that on in your head. And as you may or may not know, there's tons of research now showing that optimism and positivity and gratitude are hugely positive for your body and your long-term health and you know your heart and everything else. So these exercises are practical. They help break up the all or nothing thinking, but they're also good for your health. So the goal is to remember a good thing that happened. So think about a good thing that happened today. And even more about important, think about why it happened. So the directions say, make a point to recognize the giver behind the gift. So think about the person who made this pleasant thing happen. For example, maybe a coworker brought you a cup of coffee, a friend called just to check in, maybe somebody held the door for you or let you merge into traffic. Maybe you just witnessed an act of kindness. It doesn't matter whether the experience was big or small. Bring it to mind, relish your good fortune, and savor the kindness. And what the exercise asks you to do is think about three things. What happened? What was the good thing that happened? How did it happen? And why did it happen? So just take a minute, take your pen and pencil, and write down one good thing that happened today, how it happened, and why it happened. So just take a minute and do that. Wait, what are we uh, writing about? One good thing that happened to you today. One oh. good thing that happened to you today. Oh my God. Um. All right. So I don't think we have time to get into pairs and kind of process it with pairs. So I'm just going to ask folks in the group as a whole, kind of what was it like? What was it like to just spend a minute, think about one good thing that happened, how it happened and why it happened? Okay. I like the process of that better than thinking about flipping my lid. <laughs> it was it, it was affirming to think of a couple of positive things today. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. That's part of why I like ending on that note. I was I feel like I was able to bring that the ideas that we have learned about um 
the basics of trauma and uh, how do we stop trauma? Good, great. Every November, I do this thing where I post about gratitude or what I'm thankful for, oh. like every day in November. So I was like, oh. this, this one's really easy. Um, but actually, the thing that I hated the most about it at some point in time was you start talking about what you're appreciative for, and then people think you're bragging. <laughs> oh. So, so I was actually feeling a little triggered doing it without <laughs> posting it. <laughs> oh. Well, I'm celebrating your gratitude. <laughs> any other thoughts about the exercise or any other final questions or thoughts about the workshop in general? I feel like I don't have any, but it's about, it's almost 10 minutes late. We might have to end the meeting for now. And Professor Cushman, it looks like I've already finished the journal, but I'm not sure if it doesn't, if it doesn't look right, but it'll be, it'll I, I tried be looking my best. Thank you, Spencer. That's all I but, ever uh, heard. But I'm going to share that with you in a weekend, okay? Okay. Just, okay. Um, any, let's let's any, let other people speak, sweetie, okay? Any other thoughts or closing comments or questions from anybody else? Uh, well, I guess I could share what I, you know, the, the three things. So the good thing that happened today is a box of food my mom sent because she's a chefs and she cooks food. Uh, she, it arrived today. Um, how? I picked it up at the post office. And why? Um, because the food at college kind of sucks. So we're like, why don't you just send me food? So yeah. Go mom! Yes, mother's for the win! <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Anyone else? Any final thoughts or comments or anything? I don't think I'm actually part of a few online forums um, in which we, in recent months, um, ever since we've been experiencing this whole pandemic, um, we've actually been posting from time to time every few weeks um, what we're appreciative for, similar to, I guess, what Dr. Um, what Wynn said. Um, and yeah, so it's been, it's been really nice to kind of it obviously end on this very positive note and uplifting note. Um, and in a, in a way, even if it does feel like bragging, so what, you should be proud of yourself. So, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> it's a pandemic. We just went through a crazy election. If you can feel gratitude for anything, you know, go for that, man. All right. Well, you uh, have been an awesome group. It's been great working with you. And thank you so much for coming and, you know, being engaged and thoughtful at in the night, Friday evening on, on a Friday night. Yay. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, we could stop the recording now. Um, I was just going to say there is actually 